the finest people I have ever known are members of my own churches over the years. I have seen astonishing acts of kindness, generosity, compassion, self-sacrifice. I can honestly say the finest people I have ever known in my life have been members of my own congregations. But sometimes, sometimes, I will have a member who will do something harmful. And then I have to decide what I'm going to do about it. One time, there was a man in my congregation who slapped his son and slapped him so hard uh, his mouth bled. And uh, I didn't see it happen, but the wife was very upset with her husband, and she came to me and complained about it. And I had to decide what to do. One time, a member of my church took valuable property out of somebody else's house in the congregation. And I had to decide what to do. One time, a married man in my congregation was having an affair with a single woman in the congregation, and the wife didn't know. I knew, she didn't know, and I had to decide what to do. One time, a teenager in the youth group came to a church youth function with marijuana, and I had to decide what to do. One time, a woman in my congregation was on a committee that was doing some very uh, careful, uh, delicate work, and she undermined the work of that committee by then going behind their backs and taking action contrary to what the committee had decided. And I've had a person in my congregation who spread inaccurate information about someone else in the congregation, and I had to decide what to do. And it isn't just members of the congregation who, from time to time, do something that's harmful or not good. Pastors also sometimes do this. Priests sometimes do this. In fact, on more than one occasion, I've been involved in an investigation of another pastor. And over the years of my ministry, from time to time, people have confronted me on my behavior. So when this happens, when someone in the church harms us in some way, what should we do? How should we respond? Now, many people would say, forgive. I mean, what could be more Christian, what could be more spiritual, what could be more biblical than to forgive? I mean, after all, Jesus, in the prayer that he taught his disciples, he said, forgive us our sins just in the same way as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged. And Jesus uh, said to an angry crowd that wanted to punish, whoever is without sin, throw the first stone. And Jesus then turned to the woman who had been caught in adultery and said to her, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. And when Peter one time came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? Jesus said, no, 77 times. So it sounds like the answer is obvious here. The, the right way to respond when somebody does wrong against us is to forgive. But is that really the best response in all circumstances? Is that what is going to lead to the greatest healing and health for all concerned? What about safety? What about justice? What about being able to identify what is right and what is wrong? What about responsibility? What about accountability? 
responding with just forgive is not adequate. And that's why this passage in Matthew 18 is so important for the church. This passage gives us the other side. This passage shows us a process that can lead to better healing. Jesus begins by saying, If a brother sins, go and point out the fault just between the two of you alone. Brother is the word that was used in the early church for your fellow believers, your fellow Christians in the church. So Jesus is saying, if someone in the church sins against you, does something harmful to you, go to that person, point out their fault. Jesus doesn't say, ah, just forget about it. Jesus doesn't say, ignore it. Jesus doesn't say, avoid conflict. Jesus doesn't say, just forgive. Jesus says, go to the person, point out the fault, and do it with the two of you alone. The reason why we need to actually go to the other person is because when we make that commitment to Christ, we are also making a commitment to all those brothers and sisters who share this commitment with us. We are making a commitment to be accountable to one another. Being a Christian means being bound in community. It means we are making a commitment to grow together, to learn together, to be guided by one another, to do the ministry of Jesus together, to do the sharing together and the forgiving together and the loving together and the service to others together. Together, we express this great shalom of God, the great peace of God in the world. But what if somebody in the church is undermining all that? What if somebody in the church is undermining these fundamental ministries of the church and doing harm to us, that must be addressed. And so Jesus says, first, point out the fault just between the two of you alone. And there's good reason for the first step being, do this privately. And first of all, because you don't want to cause unneeded public embarrassment. To the other person. You know, if it's possible to meet with that person privately and work it out privately, it really doesn't have to go any further. Another good reason for doing this privately is so that you can share your feelings with that other person. You can share with them your anger, your disappointment, uh, your fears, whatever it may be. And it's important for that other person to hear that because oftentimes when somebody hurts us, they aren't aware that they have hurt us. They're not aware of what we are feeling. When we do wrong, we're usually not aware that we've done wrong. We're certainly, well, most of the time, we're not intentionally doing wrong. And so it's so important for other people to be willing to tell us when we've done something that brought harm to them. We have to hear that. Another reason for doing this one-on-one -on -one, is so that after you've shared your feelings, your experience, then it's also important to hear the other person, to hear their experience, to hear why they did it. And maybe in that sharing, uh, maybe that person will also share some information or some facts that you were not privy to before. And maybe that puts everything in a different light. You may even come to the conclusion that maybe uh, you share some of the blame and maybe there needs to be some mutual apologies. That may be the case. When we share together, privately, intimately, honestly with each other, what happens is we start to realize the other person maybe isn't a monster. That other person is uh, a lot like me. And that makes forgiveness a lot easier. Now, frankly, we don't like doing this. We don't like going to another person privately and telling them what our concerns are about their behavior and how it affected us. We don't like doing that. That's scary. We're not sure if the other person's going to be defensive. We're not sure if the other person's maybe going to get mad at us. Uh, you know, we're scared. 
And so we avoid conflict. I see that all the time in the church. We're always avoiding conflict. Well, if you're scared, bring somebody else with you so you feel more safe. In any case, don't use your fear as an excuse to do nothing. Because this work is such important work. Well, what if the person doesn't listen to you? What if the two of you get together and the offender uh, just blows you off and you have no assurance whatsoever that this isn't going to happen again? Well, then Jesus says, bring two or three witnesses. Uh, I would suggest uh, bringing along uh, two or three leaders from the church who are known for their impartiality and their wisdom and their maturity. And what these people can do is they can act as mediators. They can sit down with you and they can help you listen to each other carefully. They can help you to be accountable to each other and they can help you to find solutions that maybe were beyond your own capabilities. But you know what? Sometimes that doesn't work either. Sometimes the offender uh, isn't going to follow the counsel of these mediators. Uh, sometimes he blows them off too. So then what do you do? That's when Jesus says, well then, bring it to the church. And by the church, that could mean the congregation. It could mean, I think, uh, uh, a body of leaders that represents the church. Now, if the person won't follow the counsel, even of a body of leaders who represents the church, then that body of leaders has an important decision to make. They have to decide, is this behavior so serious, so destructive, so undermining to the ongoing ministry of this church and its ability to fulfill its mission that we have to ask this person to leave the church, to not be a part of its life together. If a person is physically abusive or sexually abusive, they cannot continue in the life of the church, in the life of the congregation. If a person is verbally abusive and, and won't stop that verbal abuse, they cannot continue in the life of the congregation. If a person's presence is making other people unsafe, they cannot continue in the life of that congregation. Now, I've led my own congregations for 36 years now, and I have never had to tell anybody that they had to leave the church. I've never had to do that. But I can imagine various scenarios where I would have to do that. Jesus then says something pretty odd. Jesus says, if they, and he's talking about the offender, if, if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. Now that's a pretty strange statement because when you look at the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Jesus heals Gentiles who come to him for help. And Jesus eats with tax collectors and treats them with respect. So what is Jesus or what is Matthew suggesting in this line? I think what Matthew is suggesting is that even if on those rare occasions when we have to tell a person that they cannot be present in the church for its ministry, even so, we do not withdraw our love and our treating the other person with respect. Because who knows, maybe that person will still turn around. Maybe that person can still change. Maybe that person can still be received back into the fellowship of the church. Because right before this passage, right before it, is the parable of the lost sheep. The one sheep who runs off and gets lost, and the shepherd goes out specifically to get that one sheep and then rejoices when he brings back that lost sheep. And right after this passage, the very next verse is about Jesus saying to Peter, forgive 77 times. So on both sides of this passage is the message, don't close the door. Don't give up on people. Continue to love, 
continue to treat with respect and leave open the possibility that that person perhaps can be restored again. Because God doesn't want anyone to be lost. God doesn't want the destruction of anyone. Forgiveness means to let go of a grudge or to let go of a debt. And that's literally what forgiveness means, to let go of a grudge or to let go of a debt. And that's very important work for us to do. That's really important for us to do. We, we have to do that many, many times in order for this life together to work. But more important than forgiveness, deeper than forgiveness, is reconciliation. Reconciliation incorporates forgiveness, but also goes beyond forgiveness. Because reconciliation is about fixing the problem. It's about confronting the problem. It's about changing the behaviors. It's about restoring a relationship that is going to be accountable and responsible and respectful and loving and mature. And this, even more than forgiveness, this, this reconciliation is at the heart of the mission of the church. When I was a young pastor, there was a woman in my congregation who was disappointed in me and angry with me and I was exasperated with her and we did not like each other and we had a lot of conflict and we could not resolve it. And this young woman, she went to the conference minister, that would be like a bishop, to complain about me. And the conference minister met with the two of us one evening. And that conference minister forced us to listen to each other and to really hear each other and to really understand each other. He made us repeat back what the other person was saying. And we had to keep repeating it back till we got it right. We had to keep repeating it back until we heard deeply so deeply that the other person could say, yeah, now you got it. Now you understand. That was a hard process. I'd never gone through that before. It was a hard process. But by the end of that evening, she and I both realized that the other person wasn't as bad as we thought. In fact, by the end of the evening, and then in the days and the weeks that followed, something happened that I would have said was impossible. I would have said it was absolutely impossible. We became friends. And I experienced Jesus' promise that where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of you. <laughs>